So our, uh, our, our speaker this week needs no introduction. Uh, uh, Evan, um, who is a local, uh, is going to tell us about some recent exciting work. Take it away, Evan. Thanks, Seth. Um, well, to give myself an introduction anyways, <laughs> I'm a postdoc at KICP and EFI. Um, so not officially with CADNOF, but I uh, like to come to seminars and things and talk with CADNOF folks. And I'm looking forward to after the pandemic ends and we return to normal life, to sort of being a part of the broader theory community at Chicago. So in a sense, I think this talk is my introduction to you folks. So hi, everyone. Um, I'm going to talk about some work that did two papers that recently came out with Rocky and Andrew Long um, on what we're calling the Gravitino Swampland conjecture. And I guess with a G minus two, I have pretty stiff competition for your attention, but I'm hoping that maybe over the next, over the course of the next 50 minutes or so, I can convince you that uh, this is exciting too. All right. Um, before I begin, though, let me just give a flashback to some of you might have been here at the time that actually my first seminar I ever gave was here at Chicago and incidentally on Swampland things before it was cool. Um, so this happened. I had met Sav at an M3 workshop at Banff in that February, and I reached out to him and said, hey, can I come visit and talk to you more about um, Dissiter type things? And so he said, Okay, give a seminar, which is off the seminar schedule, but I remember meeting many of you at that time. Um, so it's nice to be back here um, seven years later um, talking about the swamp. Um, and some broad context uh, before I get started, just in terms of the theory um, developments that have been going on. Um, one, of course, which we hear a lot about. It has its own seminar series, um, its own email list, and a series of recurring conferences and workshops is the Swampland, which I'll talk about in some detail. Um, then we also have these supergravity breakthroughs, and in particular, the connection between our 10D uh, Dissiter constructions and supergravity. I have an inflation model just sure to pop out, and I've worked on this. And there's been a small amount of work talking about how these types of Supergravity setups for dissider and string theory could be related to the swampland, in particular, this paper that I wrote with Andre, Renata, and Marco. And then this other corner up here, um, one of the most fascinating features of quantum field theory in curved space time um, is this phenomenon of particle production, um, where if the vacuum state of your quantum field theory changes non adiabatically, you can have particles just popping out of the vacuum, um, as defined with, with respect to the late time vacuum state. And of course, famously, this is an ex a famous example of this is Hawking radiation, um, which um, Bob Wald worked on very nicely in 1975. And it's summarized nicely, I was just looking at it the other day in his textbook on QFT and curved space in 1994. In the cosmology community, it was Rocky that really championed this and thinking about particles that are pre produced from uh, non adiabatic evolution in the very early universe as being the source, the origin of dark matter. And he's continued really pushing the, th this research program forward in particular with Andrew and um, expanding and building out what is the, the theory and model space um, for how dark matter could come from the early universe just from this really cool QFT curve space. So what this talk today is really about bringing these th three things together, thinking about these supergravity models as quantum field theories and curve space and what this could maybe tell us about what supergravity models are in or not in the landscape. So the, the general outline, um, one talking about this research program of taking quantum gravity, trying to use it to learn something about our universe, taking our universe, trying to use it to learn something about, uh, about quantum gravity and, um, and, and so forth, going back around through this loop. Um, and in particular, but I want to talk about it because it's sort of a tractable proxy to have some full theory of quantum gravity, supergravity, and our universe. And in particular, what does super, what does SUGRA give you that you don't have in GRA is the Gravitino. And it has this interesting feature that the Gravitino in a curved space time has a modified dispersion relation. 
And this modified dispersion relation shows some interesting features. If you have a global U1 on field space, the field space of your chiral superfields in the supergravity theory. Um, and I'm going to talk about what happens when you think of this as a QFT in curved space and the particle production that can happen and what we've termed catastrophic production of gravitinos that can happen in this specific context where you have a sound speed, which is, um, I'll explain in detail what that means in our context, uh, that can vanish. And finally, all this leads up to um, the gravitino swampland conjecture. And I'll explain sort of how this fits in to the modern context of what we think um, to be the properties of quantum gravity and what will be the implications of this. And I'm happy to be interrupted at any time. Um, that also allows me to catch my breath and keeps me from speaking too fast. So I'll take a drink of water right now. Even. And in fact, 31 slides is more slides than I usually put, put in a talk these days, which is striking going back to when I was a grad student and 44 slides is too much. Um, usually these days I do about 24, 25 and I really take my time. Today I have a lot of material I want to get through, basically these three corners and the swamp. And I think we can do it. Um, so first of all, I guess this really needs no introduction, um, but the, uh, the big push in the modern theory community has been trying to divide up our model space and models that are in the landscape versus the swamp. And roughly speaking, you can think that there's um, some quantum gravity theory, which you know is in principle one theory that has many vacua. And that's at you know high energies. This is our say theory of everything. And then we have in the world of cosmology and particle physics, we have models that people build. And you know, this is an in principle an infinite set of models that one could write down. And presumably the set of models which actually come as a limit of quantum gravity, in particular a low energy limit, so in a you know proper Wilsonian low energy effective field theory sense. Presumably only a subset of these actually come from, from quantum gravity. And this is what we refer to um, as those are models which are in the landscape versus the models that do not have this property are in the swamp. And where my talk today falls in is thinking about, we have this cosmology models and a huge push is to try to understand those cosmology models as supergravity and thinking about, um, so you go beyond the Susie scale and you have this a theory of uh, D equals four supergravity. And this, so our regular cosmology models is UV completed in supergravity, which itself should get UV completed above the KK scale and some 10D or perhaps 11D supergravity. And this gets UV completed above the string scale into string theory. And so where the, um, where this gravity and swamp line conjecture fits in is trying to understand what 4D supergravity models have a UV completion in string theory or uh, 10D supergravity. And the, the basic premise and the, the approach I'm gonna to take today. Sorry, can you go um, back for a second? Uh, right. I wanted to understand something. So the, does that mean that this Gravitino Swampland conjecture, if it's just about consistency, is it just about consistency of 10D supergravity reductions to 4D? In what sense does it, I mean? It's talking about um, which 4D supergravity models are reductions of a 10D supergravity model, including the quantum corrections that you get from string theory. Including quantum corrections. So, I mean, so for example, so we go from string theory to say type 2A, type 2B supergravity, and we know also leading quantum corrections off of quantum corrections to, to supergravity. And from there, we get down to some 4D supergravity model. And which 40 supergravity models do you get and which do you not get? Are the quantum corrections important? Um, no, not the quantum corrections that you get in 10D are important. I, I say that just to emphasize um, that. So it's, then it's really a question about just starting with the known 10D supergravities and asking what you can get from geometry and KK reduction. Right. Okay, thank you. Uh, right, so as I was mentioning, and this is broadly speaking, my whole research program is that cosmology is a great playground for these ideas. Um, and in particular, the reason for that 
is that as far as the current paradigm, how we understand cosmology is that quantum fluctuations in the very early universe, you know, literally make up um, what was once quantum fluctuations literally make up everything around us, which is to say you have uh, um, quantum vacuum fluctuations on very small scales, for example, during inflation, which are stretched by expansion of space time. They later they re-enter the horizon and we um, observe them today as a CMB. You look up in any direction in the sky, you can see these the fluctuations in the cosmic microwave background, and that encodes the quantum vacuum fluctuations um, in the very uh, early times of, of the universe. Um, and I guess this is a separate story, but I think really any um, early universe scenario that can solve the horizon problem um, really comes back to the origin of structures being quantum. We can put that aside for now and, and take inflation to be the paradigm, at least that I'm going to talk about. And I'd be remiss, though, if I didn't say that one of the most exciting developments in thinking of cosmology as a playground um, for quantum field theories um, has been the study of higher spin, uh, higher spin fields, which in string theory um, would come as massive high, higher, the massive string excitations. I mean, this is um, I'm most popularly studied in the cosmological collider physics paper by uh, Nima and Juan. And there's been a ton of fantastic work on this done by Hayden Lee, who's coming as a KICP fellow next year. Um, and I worked on this with Jim Gates, and Stefan Alexander, and a couple of their, um, and Konstantinos and Lee Jenks on looking at supersymmetric higher spin theories in this type of setup and some other things. And, and Rocking and Andrew, along with Rachel Rosen and Andrew's student have a paper that should be coming out relatively soon on uh, massive spin two fields in this sort of context. Right. So one of the most fascinating things about inflation and this, this idea of um, the very universe as being some sort of particle collider is that inflation is um, a particle factory, which is to say you take some quantum vacuum fluctuations and in precise wording, we take bunch of Davies initial conditions deep inside the horizon. And the expansion of space changes this vacuum initial condition to be um, a Hankel function in particular. And then when I um, mash this onto the post-inflation vacuum, I discover that I, I go from just being a positive frequency mode to having a positive and a negative frequency mode. And this is the smoking gun of having particles. And how you, you can really see this happening is if you track the evolution of the vacuum state. So here's a dispersion relation for these quantum fluctuations. Um, and the adapticity of the vacuum is defined by how this is changing with time relative to the size of itself. Um, and it's peaked around when um, K ray H is equal to M. So when K, usually we you say K equals H is the horizon. Here it's when K is equal to M A H is where you violate non adapticity And that's what's responsible for converting this quantum vacuum fluctuation into this uh, form here, which I can discuss things like this exponential suppression um, another day perhaps. But this is, um, and out of this, you get the Boogaloff coefficients, and this is what we call the, the presence of particles in the late time vacuum. And it, this is most famously studied in the context of black hole physics, um, which is Hawking radiation. And in, in the context of cosmology, the most dramatic effect comes from the physics at the end of inflation. And that's really what drives you know, the studies of dark matter um, gravitational production of dark matter as a long-standing research program of Rocky and Andrew. Right. So one of the things where high energy theory really comes into this and the string theory and supergravity is the well-known UV sensitivity of inflation. And in particular, it models what we call large field inflation, where the, the field goes up to Planckian values. And the reason why this is nice as sort of a classical model in the space of all inflation models is because in phase space, looking about the initial velocities, and initial values of the field, it's an attractor. You start up you know, anywhere up in the potential and eventually you'll roll down and start to inflate. So this is a big reason of the popularity of these models is that inflation is um, easy, let's say. But it has this well-known problem going back to life, which is called the Ada problem, which is that Planck suppressed operators that are corrections to your potential are not, uh, they're not suppressed if phi itself is going up to, to Planckian values. And the effect of including, say, a huge set of 
um, Planck suppressed operators and phi say is 15 and Planck is you get corrections to the potential that, that spoil the flatness and make it impossible to have enough inflation. Um, so the leading idea to resolve the Ada problem is to induce the shift symmetry, Oops. notably in the context of um, with axions. So you can go the route of natural inflation where this then requires a Planckian decay constant. You can go the route of axiom monodromy where now you can have a small decay constant and but still Planckian field ranges. And these sort of universally have a back reaction problem. Um, and briefly, let me say this back reaction problem can essentially be understood by the your your uh, the the quantity which is decreasing um, step by step is uh, ultimately in your compact space you have some conserved charge so for example if you have your b2 axon which is undergoing this monodromy it's like changing the d3 brain charge that's dissolved into the d5 we know charge is conserved uh, so this equation has to be obeyed at all times so really this is a universal feature of monodromy setups is that the, there's some conserved charge which is being um, shuffled around and this leads to back reaction effects. And this in itself is a topic for another talk. And also I should say with regards to instanton expansions and axions, we recently had a talk by John Stout, which I thought was really nice about trying to you know, resum this expansion during some um, resummation procedures and trying to understand what we can say about this expansion even for Planckian decay constants. Right, so to try to address and understand this UV sensitivity, this is where supergravity comes into the picture. Um, and what does supergravity gives you? It says, I go from having just gravity to having a graviton and a, and a gravitino. And the local supersymmetry is the gate change summation of the gravitino. So I have my scalar fields, we're going to um, become the scalar components of Carl super fields. And I specify the, the action of these Carl super fields by a Kähler potential and a super potential which essentially gives me a nonlinear sigma model with some scalar potential specified by K and W. Um, and in a back and which breaks supersymmetry, the, we have a fancy version of the Higgs mechanism called the Einstein super Higgs mechanism, wherein the, we have a Goldsteino, which is like the, sorry, the Goldstone particle of, of Susie breaking it itself is a linear combination of all fields that break um, supersymmetry. And the Gravitino eats the Goldsteino and gets a mass. Is determined by K and W. So a huge breakthrough which has happened in the, the context of supergravity and understanding supergravity cosmology is the advent of De Sitter supergravity um, as opposed to let's say textbook or ADS supergravity. And the sort of technical trick which is used here is this idea of you can have superfields that satisfy constraints and a nil, in particular uh, uh, Carl superfield satisfies a null potency constraint. And if you solve these constraint equations order, order by order in theta, um, what you find is a non-trivial solution, which relates the scalar component to the fermion component and the, and the auxiliary field. And plugging this back in, you find a supergravity theory, which has the Sitter space as the ground state. And when you transform the unitary gauge, which is to say the gravity you know, eats the gold you know, you set the gold equal to zero. This theory describes a graviton and a massive gravitino propagating on the zero space. Right. So one of the reasons why this has been heralded as to success and what's fantastic about this, this is supergravity is that in a precise sense it is the 40 uh, low energy effective field theory that describes an anti 3 brain in a supersymmetric flexion magnification as pioneered by GK, uh, getting Skashu Poltinsky, usually just abbreviated to GKP. Um, and in particular, so this is shown first in 2015 um, by um, a crew of folks all centered around Stanford at that time, including Keshav, who was on sabbatical then. And it generalized in, in a paper that Keshav and I wrote together with, with Maxim Emlin, where you can work out what is the action, uh, the formatic action describing uh, NGD3 brain in this background. And you can work out in a precise sense what is the mass spectrum of these fermions, being careful with kappa symmetry and kappa symmetry projectors and all of these things. And what you find for the spectrum in 4D is that uh, you have one massless fermion. The other fermions get a mass induced by the fluxes, the very fluxes which are which support this supersymmetric flux compactification. And you're left with one massless fermion, which is precisely the Goldstein. -o. 
and you can repackage all of this into Desider Supergravity. Evan, can we can we go back for a second to yeah. this to the supergravity? Um, so there, there, there was a there was a nice reformulation in the global supersymmetric case of of supersymmetry breaking mm -hmm. by Komogatsky and Cyborg. Yeah, with no positive fields. Right, and it's a reformulation. It doesn't give you any new physics. It's just a a a a, a cleaner way of uh, packaging um, Susie breaking. Is this meant to be the same or in, in so, the context of, of supergravity or? Yeah, so this is promoted to, to a local supersymmetry in the, so, and supergravity. Um, and so what's nice about the Komogatsky cyborg is that they showed that it's below the energy scale of some new interactions. What you arrive at is um, this has an effective description as a constrained superfield in the global supersymmetric case. Um, and what the serious supergravity is promoting this to be um, to, to local supersymmetry a constraint on superspace, and um, I think this is what you end up for for the action. So this theory has uh, a non-linearly realized. Yeah, exactly. So the big success of this paper and these equations are disgusting, but is you can write down all the local supersymmetry transformations. Well, there are no global ones, so I guess I'm confused. In, in in this case, it's gauged, right? So right, well, it's, and it's non-linearly realized because it's spontaneously broken by the covalential constant. So, I, one of the main punchlines of the paper was that they could show that the sitter spaces uh, can be realized as a spontaneous breaking of supersymmetry as opposed to an explicit breaking. And Evan, uh, okay, so then uh, the cosmological constant is breaking. Supersymmetry, right? Uh, so that's correct. So right. then, uh, why the gravitino doesn't acquire a mass associated with this? So, or... No, the gravitino does acquire a mass. That's oh, that's acquire mass. Yeah. Okay, okay, very good. Right. What is this massless fermion that you were talking about? I thought it's the Goldstino. It's the Goldstino. I, I see the Goldstino. Okay, very good. Very good. Hmm. But isn't the Goldstino Eden to give the gravitino a mass? Right. So. Yeah, that, that that's is, two different. That's a gauge fixing, right? Right. Right. So the you can transform so the equation sort of with a unitary massive, gauge. I yeah. So that in the unitary gauge, you set the Goldstein equal to zero, and that's where you see that the gravity you know, has gotten mass. Mm -hmm. um, and the well, this is, this is a, I'm so confused about this. So this is so this is if I'm Higgsing a theory yeah. that has yeah. a global U1. Yeah. And I would say at some energy scale above the, the, the mass of the Higgs, I'm going to have a theory that has um, unbroken, say, gauge U1. Yeah. Um, and it gets broken by, by spontaneously by the Higgs. Yeah. Um, so here, this theory is meant to be, so, have a linearly realized Susie. No, it has non linearly realized Susie. Everywhere. Yeah. Is non-linearly realized local supersymmetry. I think maybe we should move on though, and yeah, we can talk yeah, more okay, about I'll this. Later. About that. Okay. Um, so it's really easy to, to build cosmological models in this context, in particular because the, if S satisfies this constraint, the most general superpotential you can write down is only a constant plus a linear piece. So the idea that Marco and I had back in 2016, and it's expanded on nicely. Um, in this paper by Renan Andre and Diedrich Gross, Stan Yusuke Yamada, is that if I just take this and I say there's some perturbative corrections of the Kähler potential, which mixes this constrained field with some other field, which say corresponds to some um, bulk degree of freedom, meaning like some um, C4 field or something like this, I can get um, inflation directly out of this. And it has interesting features that um, one, the Susie breaking is completely along the S direction. So D phi W is zero, but D S W is M. And two, the Gravitino mass in this context is a constant because W itself doesn't depend on the infoton. And K itself, um, here the infoton is the real part of phi. The K itself is a constant during inflation. So in this model, and there's actually a whole class of models, the Gravitino mass is constant during inflation. 
and this is breaking as orthogonal to the cosmological evolution. And ultimately, the reason why the gravitational mass is a constant is because um, K has this symmetry in real uh, shift symmetry in the real component of phi. And so if the real component of phi is an infoton, then K is unchanged. So it's, it's this global um, U1 symmetry of K once I impose the constraint that S vanishes, that is guaranteeing that the gravitational mass is a constant during inflation. And I'll, I'll talk about this example. This, is, this sort of examples from this paper is gonna be my case study. Um, so I'm gonna be talking about the swamp and how the swamp constrains models and I'll use my own model as a, as a punching bag. Um, so now let's, let's enter the Gravitino, which is the new thing which supergravity is giving us when we take our cosmological models and lift them up to super, to super space. Um, this is the action that describes um, the Aurita Schwinger field, the massive sp spin three halves particle. And this is what you get out of supergravity um, at quadratic order in the fields and neglecting interactions with other spin half fermions, which I can comment on further um, what role they play. And what you find after much finagling and detailed calculations, and this is done in the past supergravity literature as well, is that the longitudinal mode of this massive gravitino, which is a helicity um, one half particle in its own right, has a sound speed, which is to say the dispersion relation, um, the piece that, uh, that goes with the spatial momentum, that's what we refer to as the sound speed, is not equal to one identically. Um, in fact, it's this complicated expression, which depends on the Hubble constant, which you scale over your space time, the mass of the spin three halves particle and the time dependence of that mass. And I'm gonna go through this in a disgusting amount of detail. So don't, you don't have to worry too much about it right now. Because um, what I really wanna talk about is this, the sound speed of the helicity one half gravitino in supergravity models. And this is an expression which um, we derived, it's, it's in our paper that I think is particularly illuminating and tells you what types of values can the sound speed take. So this is considering a set of N chiral superfields. And I can describe my college cosmological evolution in terms of uh, vectors in field space. So I have an F term vector and a, a phi dot vector. So this tells you how the fields each are evolving. And if the F term vector, which is the breaking of Susie, and cosmological evolution, the phi dot vector are orthogonal. Um, then, so let me say, if they're parallel, I get cos squared. This cos theta is equal to one. The whole thing, um, this correction goes away. And if they're orthogonal, this term goes to zero, and I get this maximal correction. And this term here, if you're good at your mental math, you'll know that this is a function which goes in between zero and one. So that tells me the sound speed is bounded, CS squared is bounded between zero and one. And in what sense is this a sound speed? It's that, so when you go from writing the, maybe I can skip right ahead to the, so when you write this as a second order differential equation, for example, this is your, so this is partial T plus, usually this would be C squared K, uh, C squared K squared, but C is equal to one. So if you write this, you know, double the Dirac equation to make the Klein-Gordon equation, what you get is um, omega k squared is, um, it's the time derivative squared plus c squared k squared. And I included okay. that only much later in the talk. I should have put it. Okay, that, no, that's, that's, that's fine. Um, so is there some intuition as to why it depends on this angle theta? Um, there is. And, but let me just mention, so what you, what the when you write a, do all your decompositions and you write up the Dirac equations in a way that's solvable, um, really what is appearing is this. This is the dispersion relation describing these fermions. Is that um, it's the energy per excitation, and usually we would say you know e e squared is p squared plus m squared, but now the p squared term has a coefficient which is instead of being one, is some number that's that. Um, it can be less than one. Um, yeah, okay, that, 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 that's, but. Um, and then the interpretation. Okay, but then the expression you were writing had some 
some one minus cosine squared theta. Yeah, so yeah, so that's this right is here. Is there some right. intuition as to where that comes from? Right. Um, so the, so as I said, this piece is, is maximal. So this whole thing is just one. If the field space evolution is orthogonal to this breaking of supersymmetry. And that's a, a necessary consequence. So that's a necessary ingredient for having the gravitino mass be a constant. And so I'll talk about that in a little bit of detail is that in the case that these two things are, are orthogonal, the gravitino mass um, can be a constant. And in that case, you can have a vanishing sound speed if these two things become not only orthogonal, but equal. I mean, is it, is it some statement like uh, if, uh, um, if the evolution is aligned in some way in field space that the gravitino is somehow being slowed down by mixing with something? I'm just, um... Right, so I don't have an interpretation of this other than um, I'll give an expression in terms of, um, I think maybe it'll become more clear. So this second term here needs to be identically zero in order for the sound speed to ever vanish. So this is the time dependence of the gravitino. So a necessary condition is that gravitino is a constant. And in order for the gravitino to be a constant, K needs to be a constant. And if, um, and what, what you get out of this basically is the, these things are, are connected. I think maybe this will be more, become more clear towards the end. And maybe we can talk about it more then and also perhaps more after. Okay. Right. Um, you can work out variations on sound speed in different classes of models. Um, if when you impose these nil potent constraints, it's you know trivially modified, and you can in introduce other types of constraints. Uh, for example, what's called orthogonal constraint superfields, and there's sort of a, a minor modification. And we have a, a few different subsections in our paper, which which talks about the different classes of models. Um, but let me um, sort of skip to the, the interesting bits, which is that the sound speed can vanish. We just say so the simplest example is take a constant mass gravitino and some FRW space time. And some FRW space time is characterized by an equation of state. And in particular, our radiation dominated universe has equation of state equal to one third. So, what happens if I take um, some gravitino, which is initially lighter than the Hubble parameter of this universe? And I say the universe is filled with radiation, so H is red shifting. And I move forward in time. Um, what I'll find is that at some future point in the universe, the sound speed vanishes. And then it rises up to one as H goes to zero, this whole thing just goes to one. But there's always gonna be some, if your initial, um, at, at the initial moment of the universe, if M was less than H and the universe is filled with radiation at some future time, this whole thing will pass through, will touch zero. This is you know, the, the minimal setup required to see a vanishing gravitino sound speed recently. Oops. The context in which um, the rest of this talk is, is going to be focused on is in the context of inflation, where we think we understand, you know, the initial conditions for quantum fluctuations and, and things like this. And the sound speed can vanish at the end of inflation. And in particular, if the mass is less than uh, the Hubble scale, and in particular, the Hubble scale at the end of inflation, and in particular, it can have many uh, zero touchings. So for example, here's looking at three different values of the mass. If the mass is identically one, it never touches zero, the minimum is like 0.4. And as I make it smaller, for example, up to down to 0.01, you have a huge number of times at which the sound speed touches zero. Um, and what I was mentioning before is that the, the secret sauce here is that this sound speed can only vanish if you have certain symmetry properties of the Kalen superpotential. Um, in particular, you can express the sound speed in, in this form. This is just a, a rewriting of what I had before. 
um, relating to the pressure and energy density of all your field content and the time derivative of the gravitino. And if the, the unnecessary condition for CS never vanishes, of course, that the gravitino mass be a constant. And how this pops out of these types of models is you need K and W after you enforce these constraint equations to exhibit a shift symmetry so that they are constant over the course of public evolution. And I don't have an interpretation along the way that Emil was talking about, it, like some sort of dynamical slowing down as inflation is happening, but I'll think about that. That's a cool idea. Yeah, I, I was just thinking about, um, you know, situations in uh, AMO physics where you have things that they call optical molasses, and it's basically mm -hmm. happening because the photon is strongly mixing with some, you know, atomic degrees of freedom, and that causes its propagation to slow. So there's um, no, but this can happen just with the gravitino you know, in, if you just look at Rita Stringer model in um, some Afro W space, this happens though. So, but you know, let me, let me think about that more. Cause maybe. Yeah, maybe, let's, it's, it's something for off. Um, right. So as I. Right, I think said, I missed the punchline on the previous slide. Why, why was the connection to having a symmetry? Um, because you need, the system is evolving, literally inflating, but you need K and W to be independent of time. So if K is independent of time over the course of inflation, that implies that there's a shift symmetry in K corresponding to the inflaton direction. So the field space has to have this shift symmetry in order for M3 halves to be a constant. And M3 halves needs to be a constant so that for this term to vanish and therefore to allow C CS squared to vanish. But only on shell, it has to have that, right? So after imposing the um, constraint equation in superspace. Hmm. Right, maybe let's Sorry, con constant is a function of what? Time. Okay, so otherwise you say the mass vanishes just at some particular time during cosmic evolution and after, after that epoch, it's just ordinary physics. Is that right? I'm not saying the mass vanishes. I'm saying that the mass is independent of time. Yeah. During inflation and say after inflation. Okay, so that, otherwise you just say you have a time dependent mass. Right, yeah. All right, so let's dig into what happens to quantum fluctuations when this sort of thing happens. Um, so if, back to my inflation as a particle factory example, thinking about um, some field with mass M and after W space time, and I promote the usual momentum piece to be a set of P, squ C, P squared C squared to now the C becomes CS squared, which is we call the sound speed. And we call it the sound speed because this is spatial momentum. We're separating off space and time. And you look at the apoptosis condition um, the usual behavior is that um, this quantity should go to zero as k goes to infinity because its denominator goes like omega k squared k goes to infinity this should go to infinity this everything should be adiabatic so for example deep in the uv almost should be evolving adiabatically but if i evaluate this at vanishing sound speed what i find is that in fact uh, this quantity is equal to h over m, independent of the value of k, because k drops out when CS goes to zero. And in the very mo models that allow CS to vanish in the first place, which is, oops, going back a couple slides, is if m is less than h, it's those exact models um, that then will have uh, aoticity be violated. So again, when the sound speed vanishes, in this particular case of the gravitino, uh, atomicity is violated for arbitrarily high k. Which is to say, you can reduce high k modes for free because k drops out of the dispersion relation. And then secondly, atomicity is violated, which is the driving force behind why you're producing particles. And there's technical details behind how you set up um, the actual equation of motion and then try to calculate physical observables. And maybe let me go through just 
just go on to results, but to note that the dispersion relation, this is how uh, CS enters. Um, and as a quick prelude to our results, um, what came before us uh, goes back to 1999 and early 2000s where people were looking at supergravity models um, of a single chiral superfield. And this is um, the type of results that you find we're looking at the number of particles as a function of K. So, looking, so K is the spatial momentum of the particles. And so we call this the spectrum. And so you construct this in the bogey above coefficients. Um, and the single car super field case has this interesting feature that the sound speed is always identically equal to one, which is just to say, I'm taking vectors in field space and that field space has dimension one. Um, every vector is parallel to every other one. They're just numbers. Um, and what you find is you have some peak at some finite wave number, and then it dies off at large K undergoing fast oscillations. And these fast oscillations essentially encode the fact that at high K, you start probing the oscillations on the background. So let's get to this case of the Gravitino. And in particular, we're looking at, we have the helicity three halves component and the helicity one half component. And look at the regime where the sound speed vanishes, which is M less than H. And in particular, I'm looking at m over h is 10 to the minus 2, which is this case where the sound speed vanishes many, many, many times. On the left-hand side, we're looking at the time evolution of the, eventually what uh, is inherited by the spectrum as being the bogey above coefficient. This is the amplitude of the negative frequency mode. And looking at different values of k, we see that all these values of k undergo this rise, essentially the exact same moment in time. And as you map out from these asymptotics you infer the, the particle number in the outstate vacuum, and you plot out the particle number as a function of K. And what you see is that the solicity one half mode, which is the one that has the sound seed that vanishes, grows and grows and grows and grows. You start getting oscillations. And in fact, it continues growing, growing, growing off of, off of this graph. Um, and this growth with um, unbounded growth with K is what we've called catastrophic production. And again, it essentially comes down to the fact that sound speed vanishes and all K are identical if CS is zero. Um, let's check the time. I'm doing okay for time, I guess. Um, so now what happens if we take uh, a heavier Gravitino and go into the regime where there's no, there's no zero touchings of CS squared. So CS never vanishes. In this case, what you find is similar to the, um, what came before in the, single, in the single field case where CS is identically one. You have a peak at some finite K and then it, and then it decays undergoing these fast rapid oscillations. Um, and the production of the Felicity one half particle is enhanced relative to the three halves because here we still have um, extra non idiotic evolution than, in the, than if you had no sound speed. So production is still enhanced, which means you still have a good dark matter factory. And that's what um, hopefully should appear in the not too distant future. But you don't, um, this is really the dividing line between shoot, um, having these sub Hubble uh, masses where you get this catastrophe and then heavier masses and the production is tamed. Um, right, so as I said, if you have masses less than Hubble by Hubble, what I mean is that evaluated at the end of inflation, You're looking at the post-inflationary epoch, you produce particles of arbitrarily high momentum. And we would argue that what this implies is a breakdown of the effective field theory. And this is whoop, uh, what we mean by the word catastrophic in the phrase catastrophic production. And how you can see this is say, consider some tower of operators suppressed by lambda where lambda is the cutoff scale of your, of your 40 supergravity. Whatever 40 supergravity gets UV completed into, maybe it's you know 10 supergravity, or maybe even it's something else. Um, and these operators, they break gauge symmetry. They need to be appearing at the mass because the mass is the order parameter of the spin three halves gauge symmetry. Um, and of course, if you produce uh, particles with momenta at the cutoff, then these this whole tower of operators becomes important to understanding the, the physics, which is to say. Um, if you produce even one on-shell particle, if k is equal to lambda, 
which is to say you have some physics that you've ostensibly integrated out at some length scale set by lambda if you produce a particle which can probe that length scale and that is a breakdown of the effective field theory and it's important to note that this is very different from the conventional gravitino problem um, wherein you, the problem is an observable one, or it's, an, it's really an inconvenience, which is that you produce um, too many gravitinos and they're heavy so that they dominate the universe and we could never have, our Milky Way would never have formed. Oh, can I, Evan, yeah. ask a one, maybe a basic question? So, I don't know, the feature that you show seems, it looks like tachyonic instability and, and Basically, whatever the calculation you seem to be doing is not even supported, not even talking about production of particle of the order so, of lambda. Because so there's no tachyons though, just it's the spatial, the coefficient of the spatial momentum goes to zero. So also you still have the um, temporal momentum piece. So if you think of like the full dispersion relation is like frequency squared plus momentum, spatial momentum squared. And it's that spatial momentum piece, which is, the coefficient is going to zero. So the full, um, nothing is ghostly and nothing is tachyonic. You never have a negative mass. Yeah, yeah but then uh, the, at least the physics, if I just interpret your, uh, for example, right yeah. uh, block correctly, vacuum prefers, you know, pumping up, populating higher, higher momentum mode, right? That's basically what the right, right. side yeah. is. Yeah. Basically, vacuum prefers really the exciting, heavier, heavier mode. And uh, that means that a naive interpretation of that phenomenon, when, for well, example, if I see it, is like perturbative I mean, calculation is well, not supported. But there's, right. I mean, so there's the breakdown effective field theory, but this word prefers, note that in NK, there's a K cubed in defining the number of particles on the given moment. So this is, um, uh -huh. even if the bogey above coefficient can be falling off with K, and if it's falling off slowly, slower uh -huh. than K cubed, then the particle number is still increasing. Um, so right. but is it is it the um, effective field theory that's a pr breaking approximation that's breaking down, or is it the linearized approximation that's breaking down? If you're producing a lot of these things, then their back reaction will change the evolution, right? And right. you might right. get pushed away from this point where the things are massless or are, are being heavily produced. Right. So that's the importance of the left plot, which is that all this stuff happens in this one fell swoop of the. The apicity is violated when Vs is um, passing through zero. And these oscillations happen rapidly. And it's at that moment when all K are equivalent and they all get popped out of the vacuum basically at the same time. But just so I'm understanding Emil's question better, I mean, is there anything in the action that is suppressing spatial derivatives, even if it's not at quadratic order? Right. So you're saying like is, if there's nothing in the action that's suppressing it, even at quadratic order. Then mm -hmm. it's not just a problem of the uh, of the quadratic uh, Lagrangian, but it's just a break. In, in, it's just an unphysicality of the theory. Right. So you're suppressing what? The spatial derivatives, right? Isn't the coefficient of the yeah. spatial yeah. derivative yeah. still going to zero? Yeah. Yes, so, like correct. you know, if, if you just thought like roughly of a functional integral, yeah. that's yeah. horribly ill-defined if you don't suppress the the spatial derivatives. Yeah. So um, the. But I'm what uh, is there something at higher order, not quadratic order? Right. So if, when you include so the other interactions in supergravity, so textbook supergravity gives you all the interactions, and they're all well behaved in the limit that CS is passing through zero. It's really that so the sound speed is inherited from the canonical kinetic term and the decomposition into the helicity states. But is there anything that's like di psi to the fourth in the in the Lagrangian? Something that makes spatial derivatives want to be suppressed? at all? Oh, you see, so new interactions which create an energy cost for high momentum particles. Yeah. So, I mean, they're, what those, how I would understand those is, is giving um, additional, you know, scatterings in the K channels, and in particular, also the Gavitino, it changes what linear combination it is of the different spin one half fermions in the theory. Um, so all these interactions are well behaved. Okay, this question of does, it, does interactions implicitly create an energy cost to producing these high K particles? That's a good question. And let me think about that. Um, but at the, at the least at the level that we've considered thus far, it seems like the full, so then, and this was the whole point of our paper really was to understand if 
the other stuff in the sugar would somehow ameliorate this. And right now it seems like it doesn't. And one thing about this, which is interesting is that the situation is, is unlike the effective field theory described sewer fluids, um, which Dan Sun did, right, I think is in the audience, um, where the sound speed comes from a dimension eight operator, where the effective field theory is described by some general function built out of the kinetic term of your, of your field, which is how you get the phone on. And the sound speed is a competition between the second derivatives and the first derivatives of this function. So the, what's giving you a non-zero sound speed is at least a dimension eight operator. Um, right. So I have seven minutes left and I'll, I'll try to wrap up everything in time and then we can keep chatting. Um, so the, the title of my talk, the graph you know, salt line conjecture is essentially the claim that, that this can never happen and models actually come from the landscape. And a conservative interpretation of this is that the supergravity models which do have this um, feature are themselves just incomplete. They're just missing some extra terms which would make sure that CS squared is never equal to zero. And in this sense, it's very much like the no global symmetries um, lower of quantum gravity and that it's just a non-vanishing statement. If it's around not in the no global symmetries we, before we had the weak gravity conjecture, you would say in principle, I could just put in some arbitrarily small deformation of theory which breaks the global symmetry and then I am satisfying this. So here you could put in an arbitrarily small deformation of the theory, um, some new operator, which gives a time dependence to Gavitino and it would lift the zeros of CS squared. And I'll talk about um, going beyond just non-vanishing statement a little bit. Um, all right, so this is the, the GSC, is just the statement that the sound speed can't vanish in theories that actually come from the landscape. Uh, I'm still coming back to this discussion that we were having before. I mean, is it a conjecture? Or is it a result? The it's a it's a conjecture that why is it just a conjecture? Right. So I think it's I mean, so you have to prove that supergravity models cannot come from the landscape. So how can I prove that like this model does not come from the landscape? No, I'm I, I'm my question is different. My my question yeah. is it looked before like CS equals zero is just completely unphysical from the point of view of the low energy physics. And what, I mean, there's a, there's a huge number of through gravity models that, that have this feature. But don't, don't you just not suppress the spatial derivative fluctuation? It just seems like ill-defined and effective field theory. So, so I don't think it's ill-defined and effective field theory. I mean, so for example, in P of X theories, um, you can have CS pass through zero, touch zero, and all it is is violating, I think, the, the strong energy condition. Or no, sorry, the null energy condition. So there are examples where people have looked at, you know, you can have a consistent effective field theory with sound speed that vanishes. And actually, these types of models um, are, is an example where you can actually, you can construct um, a consistent effective field theory. So the, does the vanishing CS always imply this catastrophic production? Is it one-to-one, -one, first of all? So what we can say is that it always implies violation of adiabaticity, so the vacuum state is changing rapidly. And that's a general diagnostic for resident produced particles. And then I can say we have numerical evidence that at least if you attract, if you, you know, impose a bunch of initial conditions and, and evolve these forwards, that intuition does play through, but, um, you know, intuition is not evidence you need. So um, I can't say whether or not there exists some case where CS could vanish and it, um, that there's not a one-to-one -one correspondence between catastrophe and CS squared equals zero, even if I have a hunch that, that there is. So, so, that, the, yeah. so then, I'm just so the reasoning behind your conjecture is that for a theory with a vanishing uh, sound speed leads yeah. to this sort of instability, and you, yeah. you you judge that that's sick theory, and therefore you want to say that you don't you want to avoid those theories, right? That's basically yeah. it. But yeah. then you also mentioned that there are plethora of theories which it does have a CS 
uh, passing through to zero. Yeah. And th then those theories must have therefore exhibit some sort of a catastrophic instability. Right, right. So the models which have that property have the catastrophic production and then I can, I can tame it by adding in new terms um, that basically break the symmetries of the chaos potential. You have time dependence of gravitational mass and here's the sound speed getting lifted as I change this parameter, which is in some model, I'm changing the time dependence of the gravitational mass and you lift the zeros. Okay. Um, so I can add in new terms to your model, which will make it satisfy the GSC. Okay. Um, and, okay, back to this question, is it a conjecture or a result? I mean, the, this, I, I think that's somewhat of a feature, which is to say, I think this is a swamp conjecture that is almost certainly true. And it's almost certainly true perhaps in the strongest sense that if you have perturbative corrections to the Kähler potential, this will generate a time dependence of the gravitational mass. And we know the Kähler potential gets corrections from alpha prime NGS. Um, mo the most famous example, I guess, is the alpha prime cubed correction, which is a trace of Riemann to the four, which is uh, worked out nicely in um, the Becker sisters and Hack and Louis, the, the correction of the Kähler potential that you get from this. And I mean, the importance of these types of corrections and supersymmetry is broken is spelled out really nicely by Sav in this article. Um, and as soon as you have these types of corrections, you generate time dependence in the gravitational mass. Um, and that would raise the zeros of CS. And then the other piece of evidence, which is, um, this is say consistent with, but it is no ca causal relationship as far as we know, is that in KKLT and large volume scenario, which are the two leading candidates for how to um, get cosmology out of string theory, um, if uh, the gravitational mass is less than Hubble, you, you destabilize the compactification. So they all need, they both need M is bigger than Hubble to, you know, have this consistent background for you to do cosmology in. So there's no, um, as far as you know, there's no causal link between the dynamics of compactification and the gravitational sound speed, but they seem to be um, pointing to the same result that the gravitational mass needs to be bigger than, than Hubble. But again, the, the, the way which you can cure all of this is through corrections to the Kähler potential. I see there's a chat. Um, okay, so maybe let's come back to that. Sorry, and I guess it's already 2.30. So let me wrap up really quickly. I'll make my final provocative claim. And I'll finish with my provocative claim. If a graphene is observed, you won't see B modes which is primordial gravitational waves. Because what we're here is saying the null hypothesis is if you had a constant mass gravitino, then, we're, then we have this relationship between the gravitational mass and energy scale of inflation. Energy scale of inflation, we can measure primordial gravitational waves. And gravitinos, you can hope to observe at some collider. Um, the relationship between these, that M is bigger than H, tells you that if you observe gravitino, you don't see gravitational waves. Or on the other hand, if you um, see gravitational waves, then you won't see a gravitino. And if you observe both of these things, then you have proof of either the gravitational you know, mass is changing with time, or you're changing the thermal history of the universe in some way, which I think would be a cool, would be amazing. So this, yeah. Um, so quick summary, and maybe I'll leave this up and take questions, um, which is that Massive density halves fields are weird, and they're weird even in supergravity. We thought that supergravity would cure all problems, but in fact, it doesn't. And um, model building in supergravity is not free from constraints. In particular, it's easy to write down a model of supergravity that once you study quantum fluctuations of the gravitino has an instability. And um, the fact that this instability is not cured, it's by, by supergravity itself, and it's not shut off above the Susie breaking scale. Um, we take that as evidence that um, there must be some underlying principle in the landscape, which tells you that these models are not physical. Um, and this is what we call the gravitational solving conjecture. And finally, it would be neat if, and this is like um, evidence-free, an evidence-free conjecture, um, if you could somehow promote this non-vanishing statement to bigger than say an order one fraction. So, Maybe there exists some number D that you could calculate in string theory and CS squared would be bigger than one over D. Um, right, in the future directions, 
if now let me say thanks and um, I can take questions. I'm sorry for going a few minutes over time. Thanks, Evan. I'll, I'll clap for everyone. Awesome. Yeah, uh, maybe a couple questions. Maybe. Yeah, I I, I'm still puzzled about the the the, lo the, the logic. So um, you have this expression for the gravitino mass, which depends on phi dot and f, and the the. The, the shift away from some canonical value is proportional to phi dot. Phi dot is some cosmologically evolving field. Is that in my understanding? Right. So the sound speed depends on f and phi dot. Yeah, and could you could you put back yeah, up yeah. that uh, slide? Um, right. Yeah, that one. Yeah, and, and phi dot so, is evolving. So, time. So, Phi is phi is what here? Uh, so phi is all the chiral superfields. So the scalar all components. The all the all the scalar the vector fields. is okay. the is the set of scalars. They're time derivatives. Right. So so I need for the sound speed to vanish. I need for phi dot to be tuned to some particular value. Yeah. Now yeah. phi dot is evolving because it's somewhere on its potential, and there's cosmology and whatnot. But if I'm producing huge numbers of gravitinos, then I change the cosmological evolution history. Right. So, and presumably phi dot changes too. So right. it seems like if, if, there, if there's some particular, so one over CS is like some cutoff on K where production happens below that K. And so it seems like for you to conclude that something is going bad, you need for CS to get arbitrarily small. But if CS gets small enough, then there's large production of gravitinos, which changes the evolution history, which pushes you away from CS going to zero. So that's why I asked my question, is this a problem with effective field theory or is this a problem with the linearized approximation? Right. So the right, so the worry would be, and so there's two things in there, like it's like EV cutoff going like one over CS, but then let me address this back reaction question, which is, so would the production of particles change the evolution of phi dot such that CS actually doesn't go through zero? Yep. And I think, so to answer that question, you need to do this on the lattice. So what we have right now is, this is just some evidence that that's not the case, which is that it seems like this is synchronized as CS um, passes through zero, but you know, it's possible that the system self-regulates once you go, once you were to do a full lattice calculation. Uh, and I don't have, we don't have the answer to that question right now. And that certainly that also stands at why this is um, conjecture. And so, you know, it's possible that the, the effective field theory itself. Can't, can't, can't you just write down some Boltzmann equations for, you know, how the density of produced gravitinos affects the back reacts on the evolution history? Right, right. And it doesn't feel like you should have to ne necessarily do some numerical simulation, it's right. just some back of the envelope estimation of how yeah. the density of produced gravitinos back reacts right. should be sufficient. But, but, so we have done that, but the zero sort of thing before doing that though is either in, in order for that back reaction to happen, there would need to be some time window in between which you've produced this set of particles. I mean. Sorry? Uh, Clay was talking to somebody outside his door. There would need to be some time window in between when you produce particles up to some phi of k, and that has some energy density which stops the evolution of phi, therefore preventing the production of the higher values of k. Yeah, it's. I guess it's sort of a competition as to whether the the nonlinearity kicks in before you get into trouble with the cutoff. Yeah. Okay. And. So we're right now. We think the answer is that the EFT breaks down before sort of back reaction stops production, but that requires lattice calculation definitely. And the back you can do back of the envelope calculations, and it's not um, um, it's not clear. Okay. Other questions?
let me stop recording and then maybe we can have a, a more casual uh, discussion.